Hello and welcome to Political Football. My name is Julianne Schultz and it's my privilege to be hosting a distinguished panel here today. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the very many different lands on which we all are and on which you, the audience, will be watching this from. This is a Zoom enactment of what had been planned to be a live Brisbane Writers' Festival event until COVID sent us all into lockdown. What Happened Next, The Legacies, is one of two sessions which have been scheduled for the 50th anniversary of the transformative anti-Springboks demonstrations in Brisbane on July 31, 1971. This demonstration was the brutal culmination of protests around Australia against that year's tour by South, South Africa's all-white Springbok, Springboks rugby team and apartheid more generally which was becoming an increasingly urgent political issue around the world at the time. Sport was suddenly freighted with politics. In this session, we will be exploring some of the political, social and cultural legacies of that surprisingly violent demonstration. It set many on a path to political activism and it eventually led to many changes in politics, race relations, policing, the courts and laws. Indeed, changes in the way we understood the world and what was acceptable. Apartheid ended in South Africa and structural, eventually, and structural racism, well, I'll start that again. Apartheid ended in South Africa several decades later and structural racism came to be taken much more seriously here and elsewhere around the world. But in the short term, it also involved mm. the Joby Yorkipedism government. Over the next 15 years, it became increasingly authoritarian and disdainful of civil rights until it overstepped the mark and crumbled under the accumulated weight of corruption and then commissioned the most unlikely inquiry and lost power. To reflect on the transformative changes that must have seemed impossible in 1971, we have a distinguished panel, a judge or a retired judge, Rosalind Atkinson, a historian, Raymond, bon Raymond Evans, a former police commissioner, Bob Atkinson, and a First Nations activist, Sam Watson. Our focus is on the subsequent political, administrative and cultural changes and their ongoing contemporary relevance. Change always seems slow and hard. Those with power are reluctant to cede it and institutions have an interest in maintaining the status quo. But the human spirit is restless and the best principles of equality and respect pushes towards new frontiers, as well as old issues that still need to be resolved. The Anglo-American historian Linda Colley who many think would deserve a Nobel Prize if such an award were given to historians, says that without major catastrophes, transformative change generally takes three score years and 10. So we're at two score years and 10 since the Springbok protests helped trigger profound changes in race relations, the position of women, the rule of law and policing here. It would have been hard to imagine that Queensland and South Africa could change so much in 50 years. They are both now profoundly different but there's still much to learn and do. So to explore that, I'm now going to invite our panels to, to panel us to reflect on, on the changes that have occurred and where it might go. First, I'd like to start with uh, Rosalind Atkinson. Uh, Ros is a distinguished former judge of the Queensland Supreme Court, the longtime chair of the Queensland Law Reform Commissioner, Commission, and she's played a role in many important inquiries since her, her retirement. Um, on a personal note, at the time of the Springbok demonstration, she was one of my teachers at St. Peter's College in Brisbane. And although I was only in year 10 and very newly arrived in Queensland, I think we were probably on the same page. So, Ros, what do you think has changed since then and, and what are the big lessons that we've taken from it? Well, thanks, Julianne. And can I start with that year? Uh, indeed, I was a very new teacher uh, and... Uh, teaching at a Lutheran school, of course, had its complexities given what was going on in Queensland. I had a Stop the Tours badge, but I wore it very discreetly until I showed it to another teacher who I thought would be sympathetic to the cause, but was roundly abused by that teacher. And at morning assembly, it was said it was the duty of every citizen to obey the government, no matter what the government did, uh, and I realised I was in hostile territory. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, we discussed it in all the English classes that I taught. Uh, the wonderful thing about teenagers is they're always interested in ideas and we had uh, terrific, interesting, varied discussions. 
Nobody reported it to their parents or to the rest of the school. Uh, so we managed to have those discussions um, and get away with it. Um, but I think, uh, and of course, I had many friends who were involved in the demonstrations and people came to our house that night who were injured. Um, but I think if I can start with the negative effects, I think there were short and me medium term negative effects. Mm -hmm. And one was, I think, the rise of uh, the oppressive regime of the Yoko Peterson and the political corruption of the police. There had been some uh, corruption in the police prior to that with Bischoff, but the political corruption that happened uh, really, I think, came out of that state of emergency uh, that happened when the Springboks uh, toured. And there was a huge schism then between the newly graduated class of university students. Often we were first in family to go to university. We had much in common with young police officers, but uh, the politics of the time didn't allow that to happen. And there was a huge schism that grew up between us. Similarly, there was a schism between country and city. Uh, Whitrod, the reforming police commissioner, had brought down a lot of police from the country and they wore different uniforms from the city police. The city police were in blue, the country police were in khaki. Mm -hmm. And so the difference between them was very obvious. Um, and it was the country police who refused to obey the direction given by the police commissioner, Whitrod, not to charge the demonstrators who were across the road. So I think that was big negative that came out of it and led to the ascension of Terry Lewis and it took a long time and cataclysmic change for the police uh, force to turn into the police service and become the reformed institution that we can rely on today. But I think there were positives that came out of it too. And one was the growing realisation that it was racism at home that had to be tackled. And that led to the development of uh, key um, organisations such as the Aboriginal Legal Service and other community controlled organisations. It led to the growth of a commitment to rights that found expression in the Woodward Royal Commission and subsequent land rights legislation uh, in 1975, the Race Discrimination Act and subsequent human rights legislation and seminal cases under uh, that act, culminating, of course, in Mabo and the understanding of native title and the end of terra nullius. Um, the influence of the Springbok protests on women and the law was at best indirect. Uh, this was a mainly male-dominated protest movement against a very male sporting team and a very male sporting culture. But the commitment to rights, of course, led to the development of rights for women. Sex Discrimination Act was passed. And long term, I think it's led to the great strength of First Nations leadership of community controlled organizations. Just this morning, I listened to Pat Turner, who's the head of the uh, peak body for community controlled organizations, speaking about the role of First Nations leadership in closing the gap. And all of that leadership arose out of a recognition of racism in Australia, which commenced with people thinking about racism elsewhere. Um, and as well as the Sex Discrimination Act, of course, the other rights, big rights uh, legislation we have is the Disability Discrimination Act and the recognition of intersexual discrimination against um, First Nations women, against First Nations people with disability and important organisations such as the First Nations people with disability. And interestingly enough, internationally, I think it created a bond between Australians and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. 
which is part of the explanation of why so many Australians went to South Africa after the end of the apartheid government to assist. And I was given the wonderful opportunity to visit South Africa to assist in developing the uh, equality courts which were created um, and to be involved in judicial education as to equality and anti-discrimination. A wonderful uh, uh, judicial education course I went to and spoke at involved all judges from Arthur Chaskelson, who was president of the Constitutional Court, down to magistrates from remote uh, areas of all races, uh, many sexes, uh, the huge uh, equality between people, the growth of that uh, understanding of diversity and the strength of diversity. Of course, South Africa still has a lot of problems to overcome because of economic inequality, and that doesn't go yeah. away just because you create um, facial equality. But nevertheless, um, that relationship between uh, us from the anti-apartheid movement and South Africans is very much remembered and understood by them when we go there. It's so interesting, isn't it, that, that international connection? I mean, how movements happen globally and, and ricochet around the world. I mean, that's a, a great example of, of that process. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, Raymond, to put this into a bit of a sort of long historical context, I'm interested in, in, your, uh, in your reflections. Um, um, most, I mean, you've written so many books and so many articles and essays that have been so important in terms of shaping our thinking and understanding of, of what's gone on before. Um, I mentioned in this context just the, um, the, the, the most recent, um, excuse me, she says reaching, uh, reaching um, your essay in this little book, Bjorki Blues, which has got a very nice evocation of your, of an experience a bit later than this, uh, than this event that we're, um, we're talking about today, but in the same, in the same suite of, uh, of times. So over to you. Okay, thanks, Julianne. Um, in 1984, uh, that's the year I mean, not the book, I was in London and I was there as a researcher uh, looking into parts of Queensland history that you can't find out in Queensland. But towards the end of my study leave there, I um, attended a film showing of a documentary that had been made the previous year in New Zealand about the South African rugby union tour of New Zealand in 1981 and of the convulsive protests that had occurred in the streets of New Zealand. And around 2,000 people were um, arrested during those protests. Now, the, the film was called Pachu, Pachu. And uh, why I'm telling you about this is that, uh, you know, I'm an avid film goer, but uh, that particular day, I attended a film I had never seen such audience response to. The atmosphere in the um, audience in the darkened auditorium was electric. The normally phlegmatic, um, uh, world-weary Londoners were just absolutely galvanised by what was going on in these protests down under and uh, crying out in shock and alarm in the cinema as um, they saw the, the street warfare that was occurring and actually cheering and stamping at, at the, in support of the bravery and the articulation and fortitude of the protesters. And as the lights came on, someone stood up in the audience and gave turned around to the audience, gave an impromptu speech. Everyone in the audience stayed in their seats and listened and this spirited discussion began about apartheid and racism. Now, I was sitting there, I was soon to return to Queensland, and I was just absolutely overcome with emotion because so many things in that movie reminded me of what had happened in Brisbane in 1971. The police putting up the barbed wire entanglements in Wellington and Auckland, thinking back then to the exhibition grounds with its barbed wire entanglements and 
and, and protesters getting attacked by drunken rugby supporters with the police standing off and doing nothing about it. And I was thinking about Dan O'Neill going up to Toowoomba and getting attacked by the protesters and the police standing off and doing nothing about it. And, uh, and of course, the police themselves with their batons charging the demonstrators, actually grunting in the film. They, had a, they sort of had an official grunt that they were using. And I was thinking, of course, as we've already seen of the police charges at the Tower Mill and the Wickham Park that awful time in July of 71. And even for a few brief moments in the film, Suddenly in the thick of the action, we see Gary Foley and what to me looks a bit like Sam Watson and, and Dennis Walker flanking him, but, uh, but Gary speaking very cogently about international solidarity against racism. So, of course, the struggle was still going on in uh, the 1980s. Ten days earlier, I had marched in London in what was the biggest anti uh, apartheid demonstration that London had seen. And it occurred because P.W. Botha visited London at the um, invitation of Margaret Thatcher to prop up apartheid, a sort of a shot in the arm to apartheid. And we were out in the streets, 30,000 of us. So the struggle was still very much alive 13 years later and uh, 13 years after we had briefly and dramatically grappled with it in Brisbane. As you know, following the 1971 tour, the Whitlam government started to shut down sporting ties with South Africa. And Meredith Bergman, Peter McGregor, prevailed upon Donald Bradman to stop the cricket tour that was about to go ahead. And Bradman, to his great credit, decided that he should end the tour not on the question of public safety, but on the question of moral principle. And he said, Australia would not play with apartheid. And then of course, in July of 77, after the terrible Soweto uprising the year before, led by the students and with you know, great amount of death and so on that occurred, Malcolm Fraser, played a forward role in formulating the Commonwealth Glen Eagles Agreement in Scotland. And that agreement declared that racism was, quote, a dangerous sickness and that apartheid as an abomination and an abhorrent policy had to be defeated. And so all international sporting ties involving the Commonwealth were ended. Now, that, that's to the good. But on the other side of the question, Australian trading and business ties grew in this era that we're looking at here. South African exports to Australia expanded four times. Australian exports to South Africa expanded 15 times. And firms like BHP and IXL were very prominent, very heavily invested in propping up the regime. No doubt aiding the painful survival of apartheid to 1992. So, you know, you've got two sides of the question going on here. The, the sporting shutdown, but the economic intensity increasing. Getting back to the film, another scene that touched me, touched a resonant chord in me, was when a Maori woman in the film addresses a mostly Pakiha meeting of anti-Springbok protesters and urges them to look into their own historical soul as they confront racism in another land to think about it in their own land. And as we've already said here today, this is one of the things that was going on here because, and that made me think too, you know, we started confronting Australian racism, we started confronting Queensland racism. And, um, you know, most people at the time, most non-Aboriginal people did not understand anything about 
what Aborigines had experienced here historically, what they were continuing to experience, what the, um, uh, you know, what their struggle was all about and so on. And, and that included the white radicals at the University of Queensland, um, who suddenly started to become aware of their, their lack of grasp, I, su I suppose you could call it. And um, Dan O'Neill, in a very memorable speech that he gave at the end of the U of Q big strike, he said this, and uh, I'll just read a little bit of it. Dan said, I know very little about the Aborigines, but at least I know this, that they live in a different emotional world from the rest of us in Australia, the sort of world in which the demonstrators have lived for a couple of weeks is theirs day to day, a world of degradation, humiliation, suspicion, and naked hostility. This is an enormous fact which it is hard to absorb. And, and, and Dan went on, he said, it makes you aware of the courage of many blacks, a courage which must be a feature of their daily life not just a thing drummed up for a special occasion, a special event every now and then. It gives you a certain humility to be, to be participating in any of these black movements. Yet one must enter such struggles with a live and autonomous conscience, if only because it is only thus that we can recognize the basis of our responsibility. The first thing to do is to come to terms with the dimensions of our national debt to the survivors of the Aboriginal people, for we have not yet begun to live through what is in fact our historical shame. You know, Dan always speaks so very movingly and very well. And, uh, you know, um, I'm talking about myself. You know, I was, I, I had been starting to study race relations and race relations in Queensland from the mid sixties. and. In 71, on either side of the Springbok protest, in May, I published my first article about the Queensland frontier, and in November, I published the second one. And of course, the Springbok activism was in the middle, which I was involved in, and my wife was involved in it, Kay Saunders, and our friend Catherine Cronin was involved in it in Melbourne. And that was a very seminal event in us deciding, in seeing how powerful racism still was in Australia to writing the book, Exclusion, Exploitation and Extermination, which came out in 1975, but we began it in 1973. So I was getting involved much more after the Springbok protests in a lot of things, like talking at Pastor Brady's church up in Spring Hill, giving some lectures, talking to the young Black Panthers, at, at Baden and having a long seminar with them. We went on for hours talking about race relations in Australia and, uh, and all those sort of things. So, you know, speaking from a personal perspective, uh, I was like one of those young white radical people who was becoming more and more immersed in, in an understanding, not just of the present situation, but of the historical situation that had led us into the present situation. So all that from a personal and a wider political perspective is positive, you know, but, but as, as was just stated by Rosalind, it allowed the NLP to grow so much stronger through the uh, Springbok emergency and cement Bjelke Peterson's power that it was previously on a crumbling foundation. And after 1971, he dug in for another 16 long years and grew in stature and power as a result. But, you know, to, to just wind it up, history can be like a switchback ride. History is certainly not a placid, predictable beast. Just a few years after I had returned to Queensland, after seeing that movie, from London in 1984, South African apartheid had fallen, the Queensland Aboriginal Act had fallen, the Queensland Police Commissioner was in prison, guilty of corruption, several cabinet ministers and judges were in big trouble, 
Bjelke Peterson was no longer Queensland Premier and had come to win a, within a whisker of going to prison himself. The Fitzgerald inquiry had declared that all preceding repression of civil liberties, including the Springbok state of emergency, had been nothing but, quote, pure politics. And the Conservative National Party government had fallen hard after 32 years in office. So history is like a giver and a taker when we look at this. On the one hand, it, it is correct to say that the brutal police charges at the town mill during the state of emergency were the moment cementing Peterson's rule, Bielke Peterson's rule. But in the crowd being charged by those policemen was a young legal observer named Wayne Goss, who later stated that seeing three to 400 police methodically removing their badges before they attacked the protesters was the precise moment when he decided he would enter politics. And of course, among those frightened protesters was a young student named Peter Beatty, who was so badly beaten by police inside Trades Hall that he had to be hospitalized with suspected spinal injuries. And he later said, I will never forgive or forget what came next. I was verbaled by the police who manufactured the most incredible statements about the whole thing. And of course, Goss and Beatty, Beatty became the two succeeding Labor premiers who went on to implement many of the Fitzgerald reforms. So in the moment of the premier's greatest triumph, Bielke Peterson's greatest triumph, where his strong man image was cemented, lay also the seeds of his ultimate humiliating demise and the collapse of his party and government. And as a favorite author of mine, Kurt Vonnegut would say, very fondly say, and so it goes. Thank you very much, Raymond. Indeed it does. Um, one of the things that you mentioned there was, was about the importance of courage um, and that mm. courage is a feature of, of daily life. Um, mm. I guess that courage was there, you know, it takes different forms. Um, and I think in a way that that's a nice segue to, to Bob Atkinson, who was um, charged or given the job after the Fitzgerald inquiry of implementing the reforms of the police force that uh, had been recommended mm. and then later took on the role as um, as uh, Commissioner of Police in the state um, and oversaw even more sort of cultural change mm -hmm. in the police force um, and continues to, you know, play an active role as co-chair of the Domestic and Family Violence Prevention Council. Um, so, Bob, I'm interested in that sort of reflection that you've got in terms of, you know, what you remember mm -hmm. of 1971 and of the, you know, of the challenges of both existing in a police force, which was, as Rosalind said earlier, becoming increasingly politically corrupted and then getting to that position where you have, you know, a really leadership role in, in both the cultural and organisational change, um, which is a yeah. big burden. Julian, thank you for that uh, introduction and I'm very grateful for the chance to be part of this and I just um, acknowledge the comments of the uh, two previous speakers as well, Rosalind Atkinson and uh, Professor Raymond Evans. For those who might be interested, um, uh, Rosalind Atkinson and I are not related in any way, but I must say I have enormous regard for her and her work in time in particular as a Supreme Court judge. Um, so going back, I was a uh, constable with about two years service stationed at Sandgate. I wasn't uh, at the exhibition ground um, and I wasn't at the Tower Mill. Um, but um, I don't uh, say that in any way um, to try to defend uh, what happened there at either of those locations, of course. Um, it, it, in, in, in preparation for this, mm. I cast my mind back to that time, 1971, uh, and there were just so many things that were different uh, from today. Uh, and just, well, all of those, I think, except for two, um, were good. Uh, good that it, it's changed so much. Um, the road toll was literally through the roof, um, and that was mainly due to a social attitude that um, <clears throat> drink driving was acceptable. Uh, it was horrendous. Um, uh, cigarettes were prevalent. Um, 
just about everywhere you went, there was a smoke haze uh, in the room, uh, including restaurants and aeroplanes. Uh, the opportunities for women in just about any role were pretty much non-existent. Women could be nurses, school teachers, or in secretarial roles. Uh, the churches um, had a much stronger role in the community than they did today, and certainly the attendance. Um, media. Uh, our media, our information was um, from uh, the print media mm. primarily, uh, radio and television as well. But there was nothing like the technology that exists today in the 24 hour media cycle. Um, uh, we had, as I understand it, one change of government in Queensland in 72 years. I, my understanding is the Labor Party were in power for 40, the Liberal National Party Coalition came into power about 1957 and lasted for 32 years. And Jabba Jockey Peterson was Premier for 19 of those 32 years. Accidentally, as my recall, the then Premier Jack Pizzi died of a heart attack uh, in 1968. And um, uh, Jabba Jockey Peterson managed to secure the role. And then, of course, the Nationals governed in their own right. Um, the two things that I think were good at that time were that there was pretty much full employment. Um, there were jobs available to people across the country. And housing um, and homes were uh, affordable and available. Uh, and that's certainly neither of those things are necessarily the case now. Um, I, I, I think that what, it takes a long time, I think, to affect great change. Uh, if I could just change gears for a moment and just talk about the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. That was announced by Julia Gillard in November uh, 2012. But the momentum for that had built up over decades. In fact, we'd had the Ford Inquiry here some almost 20 years earlier. Um, and um, that's something that literally took a very long time to, um, to come into fruition. I was privileged to be one of the six commissioners on that Royal Commission. So following the Springbok tour, um, the um, protests against the Vietnam War, uh, and then the right to march protests. But for my, from my perspective, Queensland really started to um, change in the 80s. I think that might go down in history perhaps as one of the decades. Uh, we had the Commonwealth Games in 1982, uh, World Expo in 1988, uh, of course, the change of government in 89, the Goss government. Uh, but the most significant thing, I think, clearly was the Fitzgerald Inquiry um, in 87 to 89, that two-year period. And certainly for the police department, that um, caused um, the most significant change, total change, pretty much in my view. Just if I could duck back to Whitrod for a minute. Uh, that was interesting. I can't remember the name of the um, police minister who appointed Whitrod, um, but I think he, he was a minister who had a reform agenda, uh, but was removed not that long after Whitrod was appointed. And certainly Whitrod was unquestionably honest and had a reform agenda, uh, but was probably before his time, um, be, before, uh, and he was blindsided, of course, subsequently after the minister who supported him and appointed him. But, uh, eventually, what happened was that um, uh, one of the things that Whitrod did was uh, move Terry Lewis to Charleville as an inspector uh, and uh, Tony Murphy to Longreach. Um, and at the, in that time, senior officer positions were all approved by the government. Um, so what happened was in, in the ultimate undermining of Whitrod was that Terry Lewis, the, the position for deputy commissioner was vacant uh, and, uh, and Whitrod resigned. And then, of course, Terry Lewis became commissioner in, uh, in um, 76. Uh, so uh, for the, the Fitzgerald inquiry, um, of the inquiry um, officers were asked if they would be prepared to be involved in the implementation of the Fitzgerald inquiry recommendations and reforms. I was a number one of a number who put their hand up and said they'd like to do that. Uh, and I was appointed to that role in uh, um, 1990. Um, and the changes in the service um, were um, quite incredible. It was systemic, um, structural, every aspect of the police 
department has changed. One of the most important things was the establishment of the Criminal Justice Commission that had oversight uh, of complaints against police. There were many other, many, many changes. I won't go into them all now. Uh, it would take too long. Um, but um, hopefully, and I believe it has, that momentum has continued. I believe the public can have confidence in the police department they have today. Uh, no organisation is perfect, of course, and there's a need for eternal vigilance. <clears throat> Uh, no doubt about that, but um, I think we're not in a bad place now compared to where we were uh, back at the beginning of the inquiry in 1987. In fact, I think we're in a pretty good place. Um, it's fickle, though. Um, despite all of that, um, the Goss government only survived two terms, which I thought was quite amazing, um, but they did. Um, so um, I, I think, and maybe this reflects um, what um, Raymond, you were saying, um, that you can never relax. I think that there's a need uh, to constantly be aware and have the public debate. I really mm. do. Uh, but I think we're much better aware of that today than perhaps we ever were previously. Um, Julianne, that's probably enough for me for now. Uh, I look forward to it later. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I, I hope that um, audio quality is going to be um, going to work. It's got to be patchy from time to time, but hopefully it will be fine for the purposes of the exercise. Um, that that's it's very interesting that process of change and the need for mm. vigilance. Um, and I guess um, when I now move to um, Sam Warrapi Watson, um, who's you know a, a, a Wengaburra and Biri Gava person, an act, Aboriginal activist and socialist who's been involved in campaigning and organising many recent protests in Brisbane um, around um, First Nations rights, environmental justice, refugee rights, and against black deaths in custody. It's interesting that, that many of those sort of issues that um, are there in terms of uh, police, Aboriginal relations especially, you know, continue and take different forms over time. Um, um, so I'm just interested, Sam, I mean, we were talking before about your deep curiosity and interest in in history and what's happened before and the lessons that you can learn uh, from from that uh, to apply now. Um, I'm interested in what you, as a much younger member of, the, of this group, take from from all of this discussion and, and where you see it where you see it leading. Yeah. Um, well, first I want to acknowledge um, the younger people whose land I'm on. Um, I want to acknowledge that it wasn't given away or sold. Um, or abandoned, it was stolen um, hmm. with the use of force and violence um, and that they never ceded their sovereignty. This always will be their land and always was their land. Um, I've got a bit of a, a, a thing written about um, how I think um, we can link a lot of the uh, things that were happening in 1971 with things that are happening today um, but I want to explain that I will call Brisbane Mianjin. Um, it's my understanding that Mianjin was only the name for an area on the Brisbane River um, close to Redcliffe Place or what's known as Redcliffe Place now. Um, but Mianjin means spiky and it likely refers to the mangrove roots that would have grown in that area. Um, but Mianjin, while it, while it did refer to only that small area, it's used now um, by many Aboriginal people and um, people who fight alongside us as a name for the whole city, um, a name that pays respects to the traditional and rightful owners. All right, so looking back to 1971 um, and thinking about what's changed, um, mm -hmm. I want to look at the struggles that are taking place in the engine today. Um, and I actually want to talk about uh, what's the same um, because while so much has changed, um, there are lots of things that um, seem exactly the same. Um, so in recent years, in Mianjin, there's been no shortage of political struggles against racism, state violence and injustice. In just the last year, an estimated 30,000 people attended a Black Lives Matter rally in June after the murder of George Floyd in America. And thousands continued to attend uh, Black Lives Matter rallies that followed. Uh, there were countless refugee protests uh, that included an almost three month long 
standoff with Serco, Australian Border Force and Queensland Police. And in South East Queensland, there are currently three ongoing protest camps defending Aboriginal land from destruction. Uh, those protest camps are on Minjerribar, so-called Stradbroke Island, um, Deben Creek, which is just south of so-called Ipswich, and Jackie Kundu, which is up near Gympie. Um, there is a steady and growing stream of people attending these protests against racism, state violence, and colonisation. Um, and these are all struggles that I see having a lot in common with the struggles of the 1970s and during the Springbok tour in 1971. Protesting at the front of hotels is not a thing of the past. Last year, those refugee rights protests, as I mentioned, held the 24 seven presence at Kangaroo Point Hotel um, that lasted almost three months. Um, and also took protest activity to the Mantra Hotel in Gray Street, South Bank, in solidarity with refugees locked in the Mantra in so-called Melbourne. Um, international solidarity, um, is also something that still happens uh, in Mianjin. Uh, there have been years of ongoing international solidarity and support of the people of occupied countries like West Papua and Palestine. Um, West Papua and Palestine were focus points during the recent protest against the Land Forces Weapons Expo, where protesters drew attention to mm -hmm. weapons companies that operate on this continent who manufacture weapons that are shipped out to kill West Papuans and Palestinians. Um, Palestinian activists uh, are also protesting apartheid um, that is imposed on Palestinian people by the state of Israel um, and something that is also very similar to 1971 are the boycotts um, the Palestinian activists uh, organise. Um, Justice for Palestine is a local group um, that has been organising street marches um, and events, uh, but also organising boycotts um, around the Queen Street Mall um, and shopping centres uh, in Brisbane, where uh, brands um, that support the Israeli state um, are, you know, called into question and, and uh, boycotts are demanded um, from Justice for Palestine. One of these brands currently is Puma, who are a major sponsor of the mm -hmm. Israel uh, Football Association and Israel's uh, all Jewish uh, football team, um, a football team that Palestinian people cannot join. Um, Puma is also one of the sponsors of the State of Origin. So uh, Justice for Palestine were out on the streets uh, at the last game, um, handing out flyers and asking people to support the boycott um, another part of this boycott is that uh, world-class athletes competing in the Olympics are refusing to compete against Israeli athletes and upholding the boycotts um, on that international level. Mm. Um, so another thing that's very similar um, was that in the 1970s, uh, people who were challenging South Africa's apartheid regime were linking it to the treatment of Aboriginal people um, and people had their eyes open to the ways that mm. Aboriginal people were being treated by uh, the Australian government and the police um, and the Queensland government. Um, and there were strong comparisons um, to be made considering South Africa's apartheid regime was actually based on Queensland's uh, Aboriginal's protection and the restriction of sale of Opium Act. Um, and a lesser known fact is that South African officials actually toured Aboriginal missions in Queensland, um, including Deben Creek near Ipswich, um, to see, you know, how Queensland did apartheid um, and, you know, learn from that and take it home. Mm -hmm. um, something that still happens, the, the Palestinian activists um, who are organising today um, make a very... <clears throat> clear comparison between the colonization uh, and dispossession of land um, that Palestinians are fighting against um, and, you know, compare that to what Aboriginal people are resisting um, and have been resisting since the start of colonization. Um, people who are galvanized by the Black Lives Matter um, protests in America um, 
inevitably will learn how Aboriginal people are killed in custody by police and prison guards. Um, and, you know, people who are inspired by the resistance of land defenders at Standing Rock who are fighting against the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, I know a lot of them found their way to those land defence camps that I've mentioned um, at Deben Creek, um, Gympie and Minjeriba. Mm. Um, yeah, so the similarities aren't limited to um, the struggles and how they're taking place. Um, and how people are linking these struggles and showing solidarity. Um, there's also similarities in uh, the way that the police act. Um, I know, Roz, you said that the police were reformed into the institution that we can rely on today. Um, and Bob, you said that, uh, where is it? I have, I wrote a note here. Um, that the public can have some confidence uh, in the police today. But a year ago, uh, protesters were being pushed to the ground by police after we stopped the forced transfer of a refugee to a high security detention center. Um, the transfer vehicle was actually gone. Um, the refugee and the guards were back inside the walls of the detention center. Um, so the action was over. Um, but the police still pushed us um, over their own push bikes that they'd parked behind us um, and even snatched phones out of our hands and stomped on them um, because we were using those phones to film them. Um, mm -hmm. In October last year, a police officer coward punched a protester and then assaulted other protesters who had, um, who had crouched down to shelter. Um, the man who'd been initially hit while he was laying on the ground bleeding from his ear. Um, only two months ago at uh, the Land Forces protest, the protest against the Weapons Expo, um, police assaulted and injured several women in the watch house. Um, they broke someone's arm. Um, they violently assaulted and attempted to strip naked a person that they were arresting. And they assaulted dozens of other protesters. Um, you know, with, uh, by pushing them, by punching them. Um, and, you know, they, they walked around um, with their name badges covered uh, by things like radios and other things that they clipped onto their vest. And I imagine in the same way that the police methodically removed their name tags in 1971, these police were removing their body cameras um, as they approached pro protesters to beat them. Um, so these are just a few examples of these kinds of things, but they happen often, um, and especially when the public safety response team is involved. Um, the public safety response team, or PSRT, um, I would say are the most aggressive and violent cops um, that police protest today. Um, these are the cops that are brought in to repress the protests, um, to break them up, um, and they have a legacy that goes back to the 1970s as well. Uh, the PSRT were formed out of the Task Force Reserve and Special Branch, who were the special cops sent in to smash protests and strikes in the Bielke Peterson era. Um, my grandfather, uh, Sam Watson, Uncle Sam, as many people knew him, um, he took part in protests against the Springboks uh, in Mianjin, um, lived through the years of Bielke Peterson, um, and was a radical community organizer with the Black Panthers, um, the legal service and various other organizations. He said in 2010, that it is clear from the Queensland Crime Misconduct Commission's review of the QPS's Palm Island review, that nothing has changed inside the Queensland police culture since the days of Bjelke Peterson and Russ Hins. Um, the review that he was referring to um, was the Queensland police investigation um, into the death in custody of Marunji Dumaji on Palm Island. And I wanna talk a little bit about this because it's one of the most condemning examples of the racist violence of the Queensland police. Um, in 2004, Dumaji was picked up while walking down a Palm Island street singing Who Let the Dogs Out and was taken to the police watch house. Um, an autopsy revealed that um, Sorry, he was, he was murdered in that watch house. 
He was picked up on the street for singing, who let the dogs out as the police rolled past, and he was murdered in the police watch house uh, later that night. Um, an autopsy revealed that his liver was so badly damaged that it was nearly cleaved in two, and that his injuries were consistent with a high-speed car crash or plane crash victim. No one was charged for the murder. No one was charged with manslaughter or anything of the sort. Um, and no one was to be held accountable. Uh, and of course, Palm Island rioted and burnt down the police station and courthouse. Um, in response, Palm Island was invaded by the Queensland police. Residents were terrorized and raided. Uh, police burst into homes and aimed assault rifles at adults and children. Um, they arrested community leader Lex Watton um, who was tasered in front of his family um, and his children had guns pointed at their heads by Queensland police officers. He was arrested, tasered in front of his family for allegedly inciting the riots. Um, no one was ever held accountable for the murder of Mulder and uh, Lex Watton was imprisoned and stripped of his freedom of speech. He wasn't allowed to speak about what had happened, what was happening. Um, he, the, the week that he was convicted of inciting that riot, 22 cops were awarded medals for bravery for their part in the invasion of Palm Island. Um, and this just goes to show that the police are, are still a uh, politically, um, morally uh, corrupt, uh, uh, organization. They're an organization that protects the interests of uh, the Queensland government, um, the, the interests in destroying um, Aboriginal people and, and tearing down any ability that we, any, any, any attempt that we take at self-determination, um, like removing uh, police stations and courthouses from our land um, because we know that those things do not bring us justice mm. and that we can bring our own justice. Mm. Um, okay, Sam, that's good. I mean, we, now, can, we, can, we, can I just turn this into a conversation with, with others as well? So, because we're running yeah, sure. time a bit. Um, Bob, I know you don't want you. You're a long left, long time left the police force, so um, you know you don't want to put you in a position of having to defend um, an institution. But I just wonder if there's something anything you want to say in relation to that about the sort of I mean, because I don't think anyone's imagining that things are all all rosy everywhere. But I mean, well, I guess the purpose of this is to think about how that what the mechanisms of change are over a long period, both institutional and and otherwise. Um, no, no, thank you. And look. Um, uh, this shouldn't be an argument between myself and Sam uh, about these issues and it's very important and thank you for the opportunity to do this to point out that uh, I retired from the police department nearly nine years ago so it would be completely inappropriate for me uh, today to speak on behalf of the police department um, and since I left um, but I am still of the view um, that the police department has changed, um, has changed in just about every dimension um, from the time of the Fitzgerald inquiry um, and certainly from 1971. Uh, and I believe the public can have confidence in the police department of today. Um, so um, unless there was some specific issue no, that you'd like me to comment on, I'll leave it no, at that for now. I'm happy to leave it there. Rosalind, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about the, the gap between that sort of activism on the ground and something that becomes an institutionalised process where <laughs> different ways of doing and being um, become, you know, become what the accepted, um, um, you know, becomes what's accepted. Um, there, there's obviously a, you know, there's obviously a dynamic in that process, but, you know, things can change. Um, yeah, look, uh, I would like to comment um, on what Sam said first, if I may, Julianne. I think it's incredibly important to be challenged constantly in terms of what's going on, what's gone wrong, what's not being done well enough, and facing any modern examples of racism. And we can't pretend they don't exist. So thank you, Sam, for saying those things. It's incredibly important and uh, you do us an enormous service by bringing those things to the fore. 
Can I just, one thing I could say, however, is that now there are remedies that didn't exist before. Uh, for example, with the Palm Island case, I actually sat on the Court of Appeal when we awarded compensation to people on Palm Island who'd been treated so brutally. And uh, there's very strong judgment from Queensland courts setting out what went wrong, uh, how dreadful it was, and how compensation had to be paid for the actions that were done to the people of Palm Island. And I think that's what's mm. different, that now it's not perfect uh, and police officers constantly have to be held to account, as does the judiciary and as do each part of society. But there are now uh, mechanisms for dealing with things that didn't exist before. And it's partly because those of us who lived through very troubled times where we saw that racism and we saw that corruption um, are vig have been vigilant to ensure that it doesn't recur. And, and I know through Bob's time as police commissioner, any sign of corruption or bad behaviour by the police was immediately stomped on because of his pride in having a police service that wasn't like that. So, um, but it is incredibly important that people like Sam uh, continue to hold us to account and bring these issues up uh, so that we deal with them. Thank you. Raymond, I'm interested in your, your long perspective on all of this because one of the things that it seems to me in a lot of these areas um, is that changes can be made, you know, legislative, organisational, cultural, social changes can occur. But unless they're really, there is a constant sort of vigilance in a way, the sort of the, the bad stuff, for want of a better term, keeps on bubbling up. You know, it's sort of like it's the groundwater that keeps coming up. And I think possibly in a Queensland sense, you know, that that groundwater um, is something that we've been quite reluctant to deal with as directly as we might. Now, I know that there's, you know, as part of the sort of treaty process, there's a sort of truth telling um, um, process that is that is commencing. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts are as a historian about the capacity to incorporate and deal with um, things that have occurred in the past but continue to echo um, on it in a contemporary sense. Well, um, you know, I tried to write about this at great length in the History of Queensland book that I wrote, mm -hmm. The Long View, you know, and... Uh, of course, the, the depth of racism in Australia and sorry, in Queensland history is very profound. And you can't throw it off in a in a generation or so, you know, it, it, it is it is almost in the blood and bones of the place. And, and it really needs to be addressed in the uh, education system. It needs to be in, addressed institutionally. It needs to be addressed attitudinally right throughout the social order. It is still there. It is still deeply implanted. And uh, unfortunately, we do have a very brutal colonial history. And uh, we still have not, as an, you know, speaking as an historian, we have not come to terms with, with the depth and the persistence of that process. And of course, I wrote about this in the History of Queensland book and uh, talked about uh, took the story up until about 2004, 2005, showing, uh, uh, you know, as Sam was saying, uh, uh, towards the end of that book, talking about the Palm Island uh, crisis and, and how similar it was to, to preceding uh, patterns of injustice, you know, in, in, in our society. So, yes, you know, we're always seeing it raising its ugly head again and again. and. Um, I, I, I'm not as um, optimistic as the other panellists, Bob and Rosalind. Um, you know, I, I really do think um, we, we need to address it very, very trenchantly, very, very deeply and very, very honestly, because all those things Sam was just saying, you know, it just shows the pattern is still there. It, it's still implanted deep in the process and it comes to light over and over again. Mm -hmm. I, 
I wonder, um, I was going to ask you each a question about, you know, sort of a final question in a sense about whether you're optimistic. You, you put your finger on it, <laughs> right? And so that becomes a sort of segue for the others. So um, maybe uh, Bob and then Rosalind and then Sam, you know, what's, do you feel optimistic about, you know, the, if you look back over the sort of 50 years, there's obviously been significant changes that have occurred for the better. Um, mm -hmm. Um, do you imagine in another 50 years, um, not that most of us will be around at that time, you know, that, that we're on a similar sort of arc or do you fear that things are going backwards? I mean, it's a big question, you know, it's a moment for a, a brief, you know, speculation in, in a sense. Um, I'm just interested in, in, in how you feel about it all. Uh, you need to, you know, you... Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, again, well, I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. I think you've got to be optimistic and hopeful. I think um, the alternative is not acceptable. Uh, it, it'll be interesting in 50 years' time uh, the way that people then look back on us now, uh, the way that we look back perhaps on how things were 50 years ago. Uh, I do think that we face enormous challenges. Um, and it was interesting that today um, an announcement was made in terms of um, the bridging the gap funding by the federal government that's proposed, I think that's one of our major issues, um, the disadvantage across the board um, for people on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, uh, in, in 2038, <clears throat> it'll be 250 years since the arrival of the first fleet. That's not that <clears throat> far away. And it'll be a great shame if things haven't improved in that space uh, mm -hmm. by then. But apart from that, there are issues such as climate change, the economy, um, domestic violence. There's many, many issues we face as a society, but um, I am optimistic and hopeful that um, we will uh, manage those things uh, well into the future. And I think you've only got to look at the young people um, in, in our community today. I was always impressed. Um, one thing we did every year was get kids in from a range of schools in year 12 who were going to school each. Uh, and I've always been impressed by those young people. And I think um, we can be um, confident that um, those leaders of tomorrow will be very, very good and very, very capable. Mm. <clears throat> Ros uh, Rosa, do you want to speak at it? Sure. Um, I think Aboriginal leaders, First Nations and Tor Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal mm. leaders will not let us backslide into where we were but it's a constant struggle and those of us who are not Indigenous have to remember constantly to be humble allies of people who are fighting that struggle and continue to fight it and I think uh, until we recognise the Uluru Statement from the heart we have a big hole in the middle of our continent and once we begin to recognise that then I think we can begin to have true reconciliation uh, true treaty between Aboriginal Australians and non-Aboriginal Australians. So um, my optimism is guarded. Uh, the strength in my optimism comes from the strength of First Nations leaders such as Pat Turner, Jackie Huggins, Andrea Mason, uh, wonderful people throughout the country. Um, my, mm. The edge to that is that we have to understand that there's a humble journey for non-Indigenous Australians to travel uh, to make sure that we have true reconciliation in this country. Mm. Very, very good phrase, humble, humble journey, very good. Sam? Um, I can kind of give a two-parted answer. Um, I, was, I was gonna kind of wrap up my speech with, um, I guess this sentiment, but I'm, I'm optimistic um, that people who protest um, will continue to protest um, and continue to shake things up for as long as they have to, um, because people have always protested. Um, protest is inevitable and where there's, where there's oppression, um, there is resistance. Um, but on the other hand, I have no optimism or illusion that um, the state, um, you know, the, the government, um, the police or the courts um, can bring that change because um, the state is, you know, uh, uh, the 
rulers of a system which is inherently um, uh, exploitative and oppressive. Um, and, you know, the, the police and the courts are, are institutions that serve the state. Um, and, you know, I think that these similarities between what we, what's happening now and what was happening in 1971 are probably going to be ever present, um, um, you know, while the, while the state and while the police and while the courts still exist. And um, for examples of what can be done differently, we, we only need to look at pre-class society such as Aboriginal society where everyone had enough, um, where justice was dealt fairly, um, where, um, you know, no one, um, lived uh, below, you know, a poverty line or, or you know, lacked housing um, because, you know, they had, they, the, the people who owned the houses wanted someone to pay rent in them. Um, and, you know, all these issues that we're seeing today and, um, you know, taking other people's land, you know, that, that didn't exist um, in a pre-class society. So, yeah, yes and no to optimism. <laughs> As I've said in another another um, another another context, uh, if you, we we start talking about utopias, we need to do it carefully. Um, so let's continue to dream and take that humble journey. Thank you all very much. Um, I hope that I think there's been a very interesting discussion, and I'm sure that we are to. Uh, I hope we engage with the audience. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Hi, my name is Sarah Runcie and I'm the CEO of the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Thank you to all our distinguished panellists for their participation in our event, Political Football. Thank you to Dr Valerie Coombs, Anthony Abrams, Dan O'Neill and Dr Anne Richards for their participation as part of our first panel on the protests in Brisbane. And a big thank you to Sam Watson, Ros Atkinson, Bob Atkinson and Raymond Evans in the second panel for their reflections on the legacy of those protests in Brisbane 50 years ago. And thank you to our equally distinguished and very generous chairs, the Honourable Matt Foley and Professor Julianne Schultz. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the University of Queensland for their support for this event as it would have been held on the UQ campus, and in particular, the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Deborah Terry, who introduced the first panel. And a special thanks to Dr Anne Richards for bringing this story to the attention of Brisbane Writers' Festival and for bringing it to life through her memoir, A Book of Doors. The anti-apartheid riots in Brisbane were an important part of Brisbane and Queensland's political history. And it was part of a global dialogue on race relations, which continues today through such movements as Black Lives Matter. This is part of a program of Brisbane stories that we hope to bring to you online and in person, and as part of Brisbane Writers Festival's 60th celebrations next year. Thank you to our audience. This is not quite the way we hope to present these panels, but I hope that you've got as much out of them as you would have as a live and in-person event. And we hope to see you soon at the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Thank you.